Thank you very much, Randy, uh, for your excellent and wonderful presentation on, on the Biden's climate uh, uh, change options. Uh, you touching upon the political background in, in, the, divide, in the likely divided Congress and uh, context for foreign policy and trade policies and the implication for energy policy and innovation, green innovation. And you also touch upon the implication for a uh, possible US and Japan uh, collaboration on climate change policies. Uh, now I would like to turn, turn to the Mr. Takeda uh, for his comment and question to Randy. Uh, thank you very much, Randy. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, very insightful and uh, stimulating presentation. We are really appreciating your support and uh, friendship and uh, contribution to, the, to Japan in the area of energy policy and the climate change policy. I have uh, uh, two questions. Uh, firstly, uh, you know, what will John Kerry really do in his new role? Uh, the proposal structure, uh, proposed structure on climate change policy is under um, unprecedented and unique. Uh, what kind of division of labor between Kerry and Blinken of state or Kerry and uh, Brian Deese of NEC? Do you expect this is my first question. Um, secondly, uh, what kind of technology do you recommend for uh, future and further cooperation between US and Japan, especially in the area of uh, Indo-Pacific? Uh, Atreting Council and your team publicized a great report for about uh, clean energy cooperation between US and Japan in, in the Pacific, uh, I think uh, last month. So what kind of technology do you especially recommend uh, again, thank you very much. Thanks so much for those questions. Um, to the first question about John Kerry, um, the, the short answer is nobody knows. Um, and there, there is concern. Uh, uh, well, well, everyone is quite impressed uh, with this decision and shows seriousness. Um, there's at least some concern in the press and there's been reporting that even concerned Biden's team about how this structure will work. Um, but at the same time, um, John Kerry uh, had, and what are those concerns? That John Kerry, um, former Secretary of State, steps on Tony Blinken's toes, um, that diplomats back channel to Kerry on issues that are sort of outside of uh, the climate. Um, you know, he, he was very much involved in, in the ACU. Back, there's fear there could be back channeling there. Um, there's also uh, also fear that there could be um, just ultimately disagreements between um, two you know two very much empowered people um, in this you know uh, John Kerry used to be Tony Blinken's boss and now Tony Blinken will be above John Kerry on the org chart um, so there there are obvious questions about that um, I I don't good that people are raising questions because you do want to define what John Kerry does. Uh, what we've heard is that there will be, that he won't be focused domestically, um, that there will be uh, a domestic climate coordinator as well. So that that is one sort of clear line. And then the, the other clear line um, is that ultimately John Kerry knows his role and is a, a responsible uh, patriot uh, and wants to wants to advance uh, advance this this issue, and he will have a lot to do. So I suspect that as as this job uh, as he takes this job, that he really just won't have time to be uh, stepping on Tony Blinken's toe. Now there's I think there is a, a second question about uh, you know who takes the, the Todd Stern job or is this the Todd Stern job, the climate climate negotiator? Um, there's a question about what, what happens at, at ENR, the Bureau of Energy Resources in the State Department. Um, does it make them uh, sort of lower on the rung? And I think that those things need to be worked out. I'm not particularly concerned uh, that, that there'll be uh, clashes, uh, that there will be real issues. Um, again, John Kerry and Tony Blinken are both professionals. Um, they're friends, they worked well together. Uh, and I think that they're going to be able to find you know, clear lines. In the, at the very beginning, the very first thing that John Kerry needs to do is find ways of bringing the U.S. back to uh, the global stage. So they will rejoin Paris. 
Um, and then he will work to make the US's engagement in COP26 in Glasgow as successful as possible. So supporting uh, ambition, uh, supporting greater ambition, climate ambition, um, working to bring others along for the ride, um, really trying to make sure that there is a just transition. Um, so helping to bring developing, developing countries uh, along and helping their, their climate ambitions going up by making sure that, uh, that they benefit from the energy transition. I see this as his, his mission and I think he'll be quite good at it. Um, and I, I think that he will very much uh, uh, ha uh, <laughs> just have too much to do to get involved in some of the other things that he did with his, um, with, when he was Secretary of State. Now, what technologies uh, should collaborate on? Um, I think uh, battery storage and supply chains uh, is a great technology to work on. Lithium ion batteries, um, US and Japan both are leaders in the technology, uh, though China is producing uh, more batteries and um, really has a dominant position in the supply chain, which does create energy security risks. And so that issue in and of itself brings together a diverse group of stakeholders in the United States to support uh, an effort to, uh, to work on batteries and to work on battery supply chains to make sure that um, the battery supply chains are secure, um, to make sure that they're environmentally friendly um, and that human rights are managed. Um, you, you just don't wanna see children in the Congo mining cobalt. Um, so we need to find And so that, I think that provides a really great opportunity for collaboration uh, because um, the, all, there's no Democrat who doesn't want battery storage. And even under Donald Trump, they started working on, on, uh, on minerals and metal supply chains. So that's an area where, uh, where I think there's a great opportunity and I think it's politically durable. Um, if there is a, an electoral change or even with a, a, you know, more Republican power in the, in the Congress, if, if the Republicans were able to grow their power in, uh, in the next cycle in uh, 2022. Um, I think there's a great opportunity there. I also really think that there's a great opportunity for hydrogen. Uh, the US has recognized um, that it is behind on hydrogen. Uh, again, there's bipartisan support for hydrogen. The, um, the Rocky Mountain Institute, which is uh, uh, no friend of fossil fuels, um, has uh, been very clear that we can't, uh, we probably can't decarbonize uh, the industrial sector and parts of the transportation sector without hydrogen. Um, and at the same time, hydrogen uh, leverages expertise of the fossil fuel industry. So there's great support for hydrogen and hydrogen development from the major oil and gas companies. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, the support for carbon capture is growing. And I think um, most of the, 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 the forecasts suggest that if we're going to have a hydrogen economy, it's going to, um, it's going to need to be blue hydrogen, so produced from uh, natural gas with steam methane reforming with carbon capture, um, and, and that much of the hydrogen in the, in the short to medium term uh, will, will, be, will be that so-called blue hydrogen. And so that engages a robust group of stakeholders in the United States, um, and so it's again politically durable. And um, the, the and Japan has just has been a leader on this, and so I think the U.S. is going to look to Japan um, to help advance the technology. Um, and I and I just I already know that uh, Japanese companies are playing a role in um, some pilot projects that are uh, that are ongoing in the United. They're just getting started in the United States. Um, I see this as an opportunity for really robust collaboration. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, much. Uh, thank you Landy. And uh, uh, you touched upon the uh, possible cooperation on, 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 on specific technology like hydrogen and uh, uh, batteries uh, between the US and uh, Japan in the context of the, in the Pacific. Uh, so it's very ins insightful comments. Thank you very much. Now, uh, I'd like to turn, turn to the uh, Mr. Kawaguchi for his comments and question to Randy. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, Randy. And uh, uh, I really appreciate your insightful presentation as well as your uh, support for our uh, uh, other projects. And uh, really, really appreciate your uh, contribution to us. 
and uh, you know uh, your presentation and uh, that this uh, type of topics is really uh, timely for uh, Japan and I think uh, it's really uh, of interest to uh, many uh, uh, people or uh, including the view of this uh, project and uh, because you know uh, climate change is really uh, becoming a hot issue in Japan and uh, every day the news is around the climate change and the newspaper is dominated by this uh, in, by this issue and uh, especially as you know that uh, Japan has proclaimed uh, carbon neutrality by 2050 and so that uh, you know or every people uh, are considering how we can uh, you know or implement uh, this uh, really ambitious objective not only the government but also the businesses and uh, actually the, uh, that's why the things are really moving very fast that that's not only the case for japan but also the other countries of course uh, the eu uh, now, uh, we understand that the eu uh, european council is now uh, considering uh, about their you know budget as well as their uh, new uh, ambitious NDC and also the UK uh, is uh, also they are now trying to host uh, uh, they are hosting the COP26 next year so that's why uh, they are also considering uh, the NDC as well as uh, uh, long-term vision and also China, uh, they are now, uh, uh, they have also proclaimed uh, uh, carbon neutrality by 2060. So that, uh, you know, uh, again, the, 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 the global circumstances is really moving fast. And uh, of course, the US is always the center of this circumstance. And that's why the people are really keen on how the next uh, administration will do in this field. So that in in that sense, uh, I have uh, many questions, but uh, mm -hmm. I need to pick up some of <laughs> some of it. And uh, I have I just pick up two. And uh, one is about the uh, new uh, NDC, you know, under the new administration. You know, mm -hmm. we understand that Biden is getting back to the Paris Agreement, but to get back to the Paris Agreement, you need to uh, also uh, have a NDC. But in your presentation, there are many difficulties to have a new policy under the new uh, 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 parliament. So that, uh, you know, under that circumstances, what do you think about the new NDC under the Biden administration? And second uh, question is that uh, uh, about the uh, new relationship with the other uh, countries uh, other than Japan. You have said about the implement, implement, uh, implication for the relationship between the US and Japan. But we also uh, want to know how the US is uh, facing uh, with, for example, China or the EU. What the direction could be? Uh, that's the second question. Thank you for your uh, uh, comment on these uh, questions. Got it. Thank you. Let me take the second question first and the relationship with U.S. relationship with other countries. And um, I'll focus on the EU, the, not a country, a group, and then China. So the EU, um, the EU has signaled uh, very robustly that they want to bring back the strong transatlantic relationship. Um, that really was uh, strained during the Trump administration. Um, and, a, and a major part of that is, uh, is climate. Um, and I think a, a good signal that, um, that, this, that, that they're serious is a, a change in position that we've seen on, uh, on methane. Um, I, 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 we'll, we'll see how much, if it, if it sort of goes across a, a range of issues, but I think it's a good sign that they, they really, really want to find ways to work with the United States even if we're not able to have as robust a policy or a carbon tax uh, at, you know, compared to, to, um, to what the EU is able to do. Um, and with methane, there was some real concern uh, that um, in, about a month ago, as, as the EU was working on its methane strategy, that it would take a country level approach to uh, LNG imports and the methane intensity of LNG imports. And um, the US would do fairly poorly on that. Um, and the U.S. producers and LNG exporters were up in arms um, because the LNG exporters would be punished for a bunch of bad actors 
who um, ultimately got uh, uh, you know the, a free pass from uh, the Trump administration on doing some regulations. I mean, um, and so uh, that has changed, um, and that the EU has been very has been clear. They want to work with um, they want to work with the U.S. and work with companies and find ways of making to incentivize good behavior by US companies. So they're, they're really ready, I think, to, to find ways of encouraging uh, the US to, to uh, be stronger on, on climate. Um, I think that, that that's a great sign. Um, and, and again, um, as I said there earlier on, um, it seems unlikely there will be a new trade deal with Europe, but there could be a green trade deal with Europe. So, so clean energy, sustainability, climate action are going to be part of, a, a crucial part of the uh, United States relationship with Europe. China, of course, is much more complicated. Um, I, I don't think that there's, uh, there's going to be a tremendous change um, in at least attitude towards China between the Trump administration and the Biden administration, though the way in which they operate uh, will and, and approach the problems will be uh, will be different. Um, I think they recognize that the problems, they roughly recognize some of the problems are the same. Uh, there won't be trade wars. Um, that's not not the way in which, frankly, most of the U.S. political establishment wants to work. Um, uh, but uh, but they recognize the problem uh, of intellectual property theft, for instance, with China. Um, and so there will be any number of um, of areas where the U.S. will have uh, a, a, a conflictual relationship with China. It may not be as bombastic or as aggressive as under Trump, but it nonetheless will be conflictual. Um, and I believe, though don't quote me on this, I believe it was Secretary Kerry, uh, soon to be climate envoy Kerry, who said this, but um, I've read a lot of different things over the past couple of days, so it might not have been him, but I believe it was, who said that, when asked, asked this question, said that there is, uh, you know, a history of, um, countries who are at odds uh, on any number of issues coming together when and, and finding ways of cooperation when there is something that is in uh, addressing an issue is in their mutual self-interest. Uh, and I think climate change is one of those areas. Um, you know, and, and China has made a bunch of big commitments and on the one hand is a, a leader in clean energy, leader in battery technology. Uh, a, a leader, the leader in uh, photovoltaic production. On the other hand, uh, the, they continue to support uh, coal power plants uh, in the developing world and continue to build coal coal-fired power, power plants uh, in China. And and there's uh, there's a pretty strong indication that the the coal power plants that are being constructed are are, are greater than the official numbers. So there is real, um, there's real opportunity to cooperate with China on, uh, on the positive. Um, and there is a real opportunity to push China on the negative on their climate action. But I think that goes back to what I said earlier about uh, the US having to have credibility on this. That if the US is not acting at home and not making progress at home, then it will be harder for them to work internationally. Though it is worth noting that US emissions have been going down um, with the exception of, I think it was 2018, have roughly been going down. This year, of course, they'll go down by a significant percentage, but that's not for good reason. That's because of COVID. But US emissions in general have been going down uh, primarily because of uh, coal to gas switching, but also increasingly um, because of uh, the penetration of renewables. And I think we'll start seeing, um, you'll see fuel economy standards go back up you'll see uh, more electric vehicles. So I think there's there's opportunity for the US to continue its downward tra trajectory that it's on just by, based on market mechanisms. And so to have at least some credibility, maybe not as much as John Kerry would like. And that gets to, to your first question about NDCs. Um, I think US is going to want to, to make a, a more ambitious NDC. Uh, the question is how credible is it going to be if it's not on track to meet uh, meet its current NDC. And so I don't, again, I don't have any inside information on their strategy. I would just suspect that um, they will first try to clean clean things up at home, um, try to, to, to really show that they are, uh, that they really are acting uh, seriously within the, the parameters that they have, 
before they make a more uh, ambitious uh, NDC. The problem is the timeline. I don't know what the you know if they'll be able to do that uh, in advance of COP twenty six. Um, but I, I I think you're right that they are they 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 do have an an issue where they want to be more aggressive and they may not may not be able to be as aggressive as as they want. Again, the good thing, though not on target, the U.S. emissions still are going down, and that's a positive. Thank you, uh, thank you Randy. Uh, and thank and thank you for thank you, Kaguchi Sang, for your question and comment. And uh, uh, Randy uh, uh, touched upon a very important uh, aspect: uh, uh, implication for rebuilding trust uh, uh, of the United States vis-à-vis. Europe, and also geopolitical implication for for vis-a-vis -vis China uh, of the climate change policy. Uh, th that will be a very interesting and and dynamics uh, uh, cross Atlantic and vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, China. Thank you very much for your very excellent uh, comments and. Uh, uh, Sabri san, you, I think you have a question to Randy. Uh, thank you very much, Randy. Uh, this is uh, uh, Mark Sabri, the director of the International Collaboration of VAT. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Um, uh, I have a question about the, uh, the strategy. I think it's very uh, important to pursue the uh, bipartisan uh, efforts to overcome the two. Uh, parties uh, conflicts but uh, uh, is that good enough to uh, change this situation because uh, this is very important but uh, uh, these two parties uh, conflict is very severe and uh, uh, once it uh, comes to the uh, question about the uh, international framework or something uh, the conflict will, will uh, show up that will be shown up there uh, and uh, the all the, that's kind of the uh, continuous airport will uh, go away. So the, uh, do you think that uh, uh, in the near future, the, uh, such kind of the uh, uh, continuous airport will change the current situation? This is my first question. And the second question is that, uh, uh, how we can support the internal the effort from the uh, outward, the, the worldwide, the, uh, or the other countries can uh, support to the, uh, such kind of continuous effort uh, to not to the uh, the exit the uh, international framework uh, of the United States. Thank you very much. Two really fantastic questions. Um, the first question, um, Mr. Son, if if we could, if you could answer that question, you'd be president of the United States. Um, I, I, I just, how do we overcome the conflict between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party? It just keeps getting worse. Uh, there are fewer and fewer uh, people who are uh, deal makers. Um, I, we have to, um, I think the, the one good thing is this conversation about earmarks coming back, which I, does allow for more deal making and ultimately it does bring people together. Um, but that, requ but, uh, but otherwise you, you're, a lot of this conflict is because uh, it is, at least undergirded by large scale societal shifts in the United States um, that are about uh, changing demographics, um, changing types of work, um, where uh, people without college educations, people um, living away from cities are feeling less and less on the sort of winning side of, of the global economy. Um, and so, so uh, they've had a realignment and, and real movement towards the Republican Party. Um, and that's, that's just push people in two different directions. It's very hard to overcome. Um, on, on climate, there, there, there is some opportunity to overcome that because as I talked about, there is real interest in the Republican party. They've seen the youth vote, but then they're, they're, they've also seen the suburban vote uh, move more towards climate action as the weather impacts become more real. And I think this is one a, a really um, a great example of this. Um, I'm going to get the name of the organization not 100% right. It's like the American Garden Gardening Association. So um, it represents home gardeners um, who, you know, like, like me, I grow tomatoes in my backyard. I, I grow flowers. I grow all sorts of different vegetables. And 
home gardeners, uh, and that that represents um, a lot of a lot of uh, people living in the suburbs, a lot of people living in more rural areas. Um, they've recognized that the climate is changing because they um, can no longer grow certain certain plants because it gets too hot in the summer or they can grow certain plants longer because the winters are shorter, um, or there are more pests uh, in their garden because there's fewer hard freezes. Um, and so, so there, you're starting to see little opportunities for recognition of, of climate um, within, within communities that you wouldn't, wouldn't say traditionally be climate or environmental activist communities. Um, and so I, I do see that this, this, could, this climate could become more of a bipartisan, uh, a conversation, um, recognizing that those same communities who want to, uh, who who are sort of getting brought into this conversation, also want to be um, uh, are sort of you'd call them sort of fiscal conservatives, and so um, are are wary of big government programs, uh, are wary of uh, heavy duty regulation, are wary of um, some of the you know, more more extreme proposals you see that that are would be included in the Green New Deal. Now to your second question, is there anything the international community can do to um, help you know, keep the United States in the Paris Agreement? Um, I, I, I think that there, there are some things that perhaps not at the international diplomacy level, but at the people-to-people the -people level and at the corporate level, um, really investing in clean jobs and really when um, Japanese companies are, are working across the United States and doing, doing great things. So on the phone today talking about what Mitsubishi is doing on a hydrogen project um, and really helping the folks who are working um, in those factories, on those projects, on those, on, at those jobs, recognize why uh, moving to a more sustainable future is in their best interest. Um, and I think helping build that support at the grassroots level where, you know, particularly Japan has a has a great um, a great opportunity in the United States. I think I think could be um, could be a helpful way of building that support domestically, so that um, it's no longer good politics for the the next Republican president to um, to leave the Paris Agreement. Um, you know, Donald Trump was advised by many many Republicans not to leave, but he recognized it was good politics to leave. So um, I think we need to. It's actually about sort of changing at the grassroots. And so that employment level is, I think, where it could happen. Thank you very much, Iberia. Yeah, appreciate yeah, it. Great questions. Uh, th th thank you, Randy. Today, we, we, ha we have uh, uh, our chairman, uh, Professor Yano. I think uh, uh, he might have some comments and questions. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Bell. Uh, it was very up to date and interesting talk and hot issues, I think. I, and uh, I have one question, which is about flocking. Flocking, mm -hmm. you didn't, you did talk about it in a more less specific way, but uh, flocking was a very important issue for Mr. Biden for the uh, second debate. I, I don't know if that was a mistake or not, but uh, I, I, I think that kind of caused it a few votes in Ohio and Pennsylvania, and possibly Texas in the southern part. And uh, now, the, on the other hand, for the American economy over the next, uh, Mr. Biden says, in the long run, you want to finish it. But in the short run, he was not committed, I think, in either way or he is committed to continue, I suppose, to a certain extent. But uh, it's just that kind of uh, statement by Mr. Biden, I think costed quite a lot, a lot of votes, uh, given by, by seeing the uh, all media's reaction to that after the uh, debate. Now, on the other hand, the, he has an uh, election coming up in, 2022 for the Senate and for the uh, his own, or I don't know if he's going to run again or not, but he, he has a presidential election 2024. So I, I and it's hard to imagine that he can keep the votes from those people who are 
supported by that industry. You know, in the South, the Texas, mm -hmm. yeah, particularly, yes, I think a huge number of people are depending on it. So I wonder what his policy will be. And uh, that's also related to the, uh, I think, his Middle Eastern policy. So the overall, I think I would like to know what you would think about that. So, so you're absolutely right in that second debate um, where he, he misspoke about uh, fracking. Um, and, and frankly, he had done a remarkable job throughout the campaign um, of managing both sides of that question. He right, was right. That I don't think anybody thought he could thread. Um, by being, on the one hand, aggressive about, about climate, and on the other hand, saying that he was not going to ban fracking. Right. Um, now, as, as a pragmatist, um, I, I don't see those as in conflict, but US politics sort of frames those as in conflict. Um, and mm. and did, he did misspeak and, um, and said, it, it, it was it was a tongue tongue twister, so I don't even remember what he said. But it came across like he would ultimately ban fracking. Um, he can't ban fracking. Um, that is not something that can happen at the executive level. It would require uh, uh, the Senate uh, and the and the House, and it would require uh, a supermajority. It, it's something that isn't. It, it was a political statement that wasn't that it had no bearing on reality. Um, what mm. he can do is prevent new oil and gas leases on federal land. So, um, and that's that's something that um, would have a minimal impact on the uh, oil and gas industry. Predominantly, actually, uh, the most oil and gas leasing sort of on, on federal land is in New Mexico, which is mm -hmm. a state that Democrats control, two senators and the governor. Um, and the governor has been, as a for very, towing this line well, but a very pro-fossil fuel governor, Democrat governor. She had said that she would want maybe a waiver for New Mexico. Um, but what I understand from many of the producers was if if they were, you know, if if uh, new oil and gas leases were, were prohibited on federal lands, um, they would ultimately just move across the border to Texas, go back, that uh, same basin, um, and uh, and you would have a minimal impact on mm -hmm. the oil and gas industry uh, mm -hmm. and on. So, so that policy is actually good politics um, because it doesn't really do much to mm. the economy, um, and uh, and it really makes the the environmental community happy. And and I think you know federal lands. Uh, I as just as a personal thing, they they're the kind of, you know we want to preserve those for the future. Um, I, I sort of, I, I sort of strongly believe that even as a as a pragmatist. And so it seems like it's good you know it, it's good politics. Um, and so that's what he really what what I think the policy will look like. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to like get into how you ban fracking, simply you're just simply not. Um, they don't even have a definition for fracking because right. if you're doing any modern oil and gas well, you're going to be doing some level of hydro hydraulic fracturing. Um, and so, what does that actually mean? It was it wasn't it wasn't real. Um, so how does he manage these politics going forward? Mm -hmm. um, he stays the course. Uh, he, he tries not to not to slip up. You're right that he lost some votes. Um, uh, the polling suggests that in Pennsylvania, actually, fracking is overall less popular. Um, uh, but mm. in Texas, it's a, a different story. Right. Um, and and he did very poorly um, in the with the Latino community in Texas. Right. And right. Some of that is attributed to mm -hmm. a perception that he would undermine their employment in the oil and gas industry. Um, I don't think that's true. I actually think he, his, um, the way the world is going, we're going to, we're going to need oil and gas for a while, but at the same time, we're going to be moving towards a cleaner system and, uh, and the U S leading aggressively on that through carbon capture, through hydrogen, actually, I think extends the lifespan of these companies that keep these people employed, these enormous American companies that have so much technical capability. Um, we need those companies in order to make, meet these goals. Um, that's a hard thing to say as a politician, uh, but it, I think it's true. And I think if he can toe this line, um, he may actually do better with those groups in, in two or four years um, if, if the policies, if the, the reality is um, not what, the, what it was framed to be in the election. That's optimistic, but, uh, but um, I, I think that they have enough smart people who are going into the administration that, that I think we will, 
we'll see at least something along those lines. Thank you. So you think uh, his policy, actual policy will sink in the mind of those Latino community and uh, Ohio people in relating to uh, the flacking industry. And I think I think probably that the, the Latino community is um, it will be their first focus mm -hmm. because the Democrats recognize that right. uh, they were taking the Latino community for granted. Right. Right. And um, and it's it was interesting to see yeah. how how it voted, how the Latino community voted across different states. Um, right. But, right. Uh, but yes, I think that I think that you know a couple of things impacted the, the Latino vote. First, right, the framing right, of the Democrats right. as socialists. Mm -hmm. So you lost the Cubans and the Venezuelans for um, uh, for for obvious reason, and then then the um, the anti uh, oil and gas framing, uh, which lost the the a lot number of Latinos in, in Texas. Um, I think that 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 at least that second piece is winnable back with a uh, concerted outreach to the Latino community as a whole, specifically. Okay. Mm -hmm. Texas specifically focused on jobs. Yeah, I just I might add uh, for listeners' information that uh, Nevada and uh, te Southern Texas and Florida Latino community voted totally different ways. In that, I think so. The, uh, that's I think you're right that uh, you can dissuade or persuade uh, them by the performance of the economy and the other policies, I suppose. I agree yeah. with that. Thank you. Well, I mean, and and the, the, in Arizona, the Latino community was one of the reasons that pushed Biden uh, ahead. Right, right. So right. the Latino community, the Democrats need to realize that the Latino community needs, is not right. a monarch. It has very right. particular right. local right. issues as well as right. ties to different, uh, different cultures in different countries. I thank you very much. Thank you for your very good question. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ayano and uh, doc Dr. Bell. And uh, thank you again, uh, Landy, uh, for your excellent presentation and uh, uh, very insightful uh, uh, comment on on on, on, the, <coughs> on the Biden's climate change policy. Uh, it was very enlightening and uh, and. Uh, Insightful. Thank you. Thank you again for for your contribution to our seminar. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was a, an absolute pleasure to be here. I uh, very much enjoyed it. Thank you. So now we close our seminar. <laughs>